Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome all of you to this very special Bible study experience called Prophecy Encounter. A special warm welcome to those of you in Sanford, Florida, right here, and also those joining us across the country and around the world, our extended audience for this very important Bible series. Over the past few nights, we've been looking at some very important and fascinating prophecies in the Bible, in particular in the books of Daniel and Revelation. And tonight, we're going to be delving right in the very heart of Revelation, Revelation chapter 12, an important study. But before we get to that, as mentioned uh, previously, I wanted to let everybody know about a resource that Amazing Facts has. It goes along with these series that we're doing. It's called Prophecy Encounter. It's a set of lessons, just newly illustrated and bright and colorful. And for those of you who are watching online or on the various networks, you can go to the Prophecy Encounter website, just prophecyencounter.com, and you can order your set of Prophecy Encounter study guides, 27 fully illustrated Bible-filled teachings that I think you'll find very helpful for your own spiritual growth. Well, before we get to the presentation, we have a theme song that we like to sing from night to night. It's about the second coming of Jesus. It's called Lift Up the Trumpets. So I'm going to invite our audience here to stand as we sing, and also those watching, you can stand wherever you are and sing along with us. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. standing for opening prayer. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, what a privilege to be, able to be able to open your word and study together. And once again tonight, we want to ask for the Holy Spirit to come guide us, Lord. A very important subject, something that uh, you have revealed through Scripture, something that we need to understand and know for the times in which we are living. So we ask your special blessing upon this program tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. An important part of our time together is taking Bible questions. And I want to thank those who are watching for the many Bible questions that have come in. And we're going to try and answer as many of those as possible. And Pastor Doug and his wife Karen are going to lead out in the question Bible time for this program. So thank you, Pastor Doug and Karen. Thank you, Pastor Ross. Evening, friends. Good to see each of you here so faithfully night after night. We've got just really important studies coming in these last three presentations, so you don't want to miss one. And so we've seen some really good questions coming in. All right. Evening. Good evening. Our first question is, where in the Bible can I find answers to the question of whether Adam will be saved? Does the Bible specifically say whether or not Adam and or Eve are saved? Uh, most scholars believe the answer would be yes, because... God gave to Adam a sacrificial system by which he might be redeemed. God provided skins to cover their nakedness that they received. Adam passed on the sacrificial system to Abel, meaning that they were looking forward to the sacrifice of God's son, the Lamb of God. And so it's believed that he embraced this uh, plan of redemption and that he will be in the kingdom. So uh, that's, uh, there's no explicit scripture that says so. But I think there's enough, um, enough evidence that you can assume you will see uh, the first man and presumably Eve too also in the kingdom. What does it mean in Genesis 6 when it says these heavenly beings married human wives and had giant children? You know, this is a, uh, a verse, you find it in Genesis 6, of course, it often misunderstood. 
Let me read it to you real quick. And some of you, I don't know what translation you have. Some translations confuse people. They compound the problem because it says aliens or fallen angels had intimate relations with humans and then they had these giant children and then it is totally, that's not at all what the Bible is saying. Let me read it to you. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit will not always strive with man, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days will be 120 years. So about 120 years after this experience, the flood comes and, and uh, he gives them 120 years. Talks about Noah right after that. Who are the sons of God? It doesn't say anything in the text that they're aliens. It's not saying they're fallen angels. You look in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called sons of God. See, back when that verse was written, the human race had divided into two classes. Adam and Eve and Seth and the ones who followed God, as we just mentioned, and Cain, who left, he took one of his sisters, his wife, and he left, and he lived a life of rebellion and turning away from God. And the descendants of Cain were called the children of men. Uh, evidently, they had beautiful daughters. But when the sons of God, meaning the children of Adam and Seth, that had remained separate from the wicked, began to intermarry with the unbelievers, then wickedness filled the earth. And so that's all it's talking about when it says the sons of God. It's not talking about aliens. It's talking about when those who serve God began to intermarry with those who didn't. Pretty soon, and someone's going to say, well, Pastor Doug, but it says that giants were born to them. That's not unusual. It's called genetic vitality. Um, when you intermarry and you keep the gene pool fresh like that, you can also have more vitality. Do you know if you cross a lion and a tiger, what you get? A liger. A liger. It's true. And they're bigger than a typical lion or tiger. You can look them up online. You know what happens if you ca cross a donkey and a zebra? A zonkey. A zonkey. They're really cute. Yeah. And you know, a horse and a donkey will give you a mule. And mules are pretty big. So that's all that's talking about is genetic vitality. All right. Who is Michael in Revelation 12? Michael, sometimes referred to as Michael the Archangel, and someone picked up that, where are they? It says, and there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and you realize the dragon is obviously a symbolic name for Satan. Who is Michael? You'll sometimes see these uh, medieval paintings where it's got an angel called Raphael, and the angel Michael, and they call them the archangels. First of all, do you find Raphael anywhere in the Bible? No. It's a good name, but it's not the Bible. Um, the word Michael means who is as God. It is one of the pre-incarnate names for Christ. Now listen carefully. We are not saying Jesus is an angel. The word angel means messenger, angelos. And when it says Michael, it's talking about the one who is as God. When the leader of good fought with the leader of evil. You know this verse, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Lord himself, who? The Lord. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel. Who has the voice of the archangel? The Lord himself. Archangel, just arch is the high capstone, means the highest angel. Highest message is what that's talking about. Jesus is eternal God. Everyone listening? But in the Old Testament, he sometimes seemed to appear as Michael. Revelation drew upon that. Tells us Michael comes to resurrect Moses. Who is the resurrection? Jesus. Jesus. Revelation chapter 12. And at that time, Michael will stand up. And there will be a great time of trouble such as there never has been. This is Daniel 12. 1. Daniel 12. Yeah, Daniel 12. 1. Ever since there was a nation, even unto the same time. Who is it that the, is the great prince that stands as the intercessor for God's people? It's Christ. And so it is one of the pre-incarnate titles for Christ. The dragon is a symbol for the devil. Michael is a symbolic name for the king of kings. Please explain Colossians 2.16 and Romans 14.5 in light of the Sabbath presentation last night. All right, there's big questions. I'm glad someone wrote that in because I often try to include it. Whenever people hear the Sabbath truth, 
you'll go share it with someone and they'll direct you to these verses. Mm -hmm. By the way, before I get to it, let me just tell you something. One reason I became convinced about the Sabbath truth is because when I first started learning these things, I went to my pastor friends and I said, why do we go to church on Sunday? And if you ask 10 different pastors, you will get 11 different answers. <laughs> And uh, one would say, well, Pastor Doug, or Brother Doug, I wasn't a pastor then, they'd say, we uh, are no longer under the law, we are under grace. I said, does that mean we can break the Ten Commandments? They'd say, well, no, God abolished all ten, and he re-added nine of them in the New Testament. And I told you that's a myth. They say that the Sabbath isn't mentioned in the New Testament. Actually, it's the second commandment that's not mentioned in the New Testament. It's kind of like a person, if you've got a finger that's sore, you cut off all ten and sew the other nine back. That's not how it is. And the Sabbath is a problem they're trying to deal with. I asked another pastor, and he said, um, he said, Jesus rose the first day of the week, and Sunday now is the new Sabbath. I said, that's beautiful. Where is the command now to keep it? Do you see a command anywhere? There is no command. Uh, I, another guy was really creative. He said, Brother Doug, in the Old Testament, when Joshua prayed and the sun stood still, Saturday turned into Sunday. <laughs> and just all these different, and none of them agreed. And so I said, oh. Jesus said, remember, keep the Sabbath day holy. Do we still need a day of rest? No. Obviously, did God tell us what day? Yes, does it matter? He wouldn't have told us if it didn't matter. And so if you're ever in doubt, do what Jesus did and you're safe. Okay, so when people hear this, sometimes they're directed to these verses. Colossians chapter 2, and you go to like verse 13. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he's made alive together with him, having forgiven all of your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and taking it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And so we talked about what that was, the handwriting of Moses, the ceremonial laws and ordinances, which include annual Sabbaths. For instance, Passover, Yom Kippur, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, uh, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement are the same one. Those came once a year. They were ceremonial Sabbaths. Now, think about this real quick. The Sabbath of the Ten Commandments, did it come before or after sin? Before. Was it part of God's perfect plan or was it some, an emergency that came to deal? Part of his perfect plan. The ceremonial annual Sabbath, did they come before or after sin? After. After sin. The, um, the Sabbath of the Ten Commandments, who was it originally given to? It says that I, Sabbath was made for man. Did Adam know about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, he got Eve on Friday. What was their honeymoon? They never forgot the Sabbath. They had an anniversary every week. <laughs> and so, but these annual Sabbaths, they were part of sin. They were given to Moses. They were nailed to the cross. And so that's why, let me finish the verse here. So don't let anyone judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbaths, plural, which are shadows. There's no comma there in the original. Don't let them judge you regarding the Sabbath that are shadows, but the substances of Christ. Paul was not saying we no longer need the day of rest and that commandment is done away with. And you know, it's interesting. I never hear my friends that are Sunday pastors, they'll never stand up in their congregation and say, you don't have to come to church anymore. Don't let anyone judge you. You don't have to be here every Sunday. They're working all the time to get on their Sunday. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 14 is, it never mentions, Romans 14 doesn't even mention Sabbath. It simply says, one man regards one day above another, another man regards every day alike, let each one be persuaded in his own mind. He that regards the day, regards it unto the Lord. He that does not regard the day, to the Lord he does not regard it. He's just talking again about these ceremonial holidays. He said, look, the, the Jewish converts to Christianity, the Jews who accepted Christianity, were beginning to tell the new Gentiles, you've got to keep the law of Moses. You've got to keep these annual the Sabbaths. Sabbath, how do we keep it? What are some suggestions to help us understand how to keep it and what to do? Obviously, we've got a lot of questions on this subject. We well, that's a good question. Um, well, first of all, we've learned it's a day of resting from your regular secular labor. It says, in it thou shalt not do any work, 
you or your son or your daughter, man, servant, maid, servant, you're supposed to let people rest. Animals we're even supposed to rest. God cares about animals. It's called the Holy Convocation. That means it's a day to come together and worship Him. If there are other like believers you can gather with, gather with them. Every week around the world, there are people who don't have a local church that worship with amazing facts because we, Pastor Ross and I pastor a church and we stream it or it's archived and they get it online because there's only a handful of people in Australia in the outback and they say, we got internet. They gather together and they have a worship service and so it's kind of nice in modern times. Visit people. Give a Bible study. There's a lot of sick, lonely shut-ins you can encourage. It's okay to take a nap. It is a day of rest. Don't sleep the whole day. Uh, if you got kids, they get ants in their pants. Take them out to do something. Find some wholesome activities. It's family quality time. There's some good books out there about how to keep the Sabbath and uh, ways that it can be a blessing. It's supposed to be a blessed day. Spending time in nature is a good thing. Yeah, weather permitting, get out in nature, God's creation. Learn Jesus about would the, do that. Learn about the different things that you're looking at, the birds, the shells, the yeah. different things. Yeah, we know people that are specialists in those things. Okay. If the Bible says, thou shalt not kill, then why did David kill Goliath? Now, you know, in the Ten Commandments, when you read it in uh, the Old Testament, it says, thou shalt not kill. But when Jesus quotes that commandment, he says, thou shalt not commit murder. Technically, in the Hebrew, it says, thou shalt not commit murder. There is a difference between killing, because killing is a broad word. You step on a weed, you're killing. Are you breaking the Ten Commandments? How many of you in Florida have swatted a mosquito? <laughs> Lawbreakers. You kill that poor creature. Um, that's technically killing. That's not what the commandment means. Murder is the wrongful taking of innocent life. If a soldier comes back from defending his country, do we call them murderers? If a policeman has to discharge his weapon in a just way to deal with someone who's violently hurting someone else, is he called a murderer? No. And so murder is the wrongful taking of innocent life. David was defending the country when he killed Goliath. Goliath was challenging everyone, and the Philistines were killing Israelites, and it was self-defense. This, is, this next question is from an eight-year-old, and she writes, Can people repent on the day that Jesus returns to earth? They can try, but it would be too late. Um, that Because probation will have closed then. And so a person needs to do their praying and their uh, repenting and have their um, relationship with God resolved before the day of the Lord comes. Because the Bible tells us that when that day comes, many will declare, they'll run from Christ. They say, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. At that point, the Holy Spirit is withdrawn, and it's the Holy Spirit that gives us the gift of repentance. You find that in Acts chapter 2. And so you can't even repent without God's Spirit bringing conviction and bringing peace and healing. And so when God's Spirit is speaking to you is the best time to listen. You know, it says in the Bible, today if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart today. Now is the acceptable time. So don't be procrastinating. I, I talk to a lot of teenagers and they say, well, I kind of like to go out there and enjoy life and then when I get old, you know, then I'll give the leftovers to God. And they want to calculate when Jesus is coming so at the last minute we can then repent and be saved. Do you want to give a flower to somebody after all the petals fall off? <laughs> Nothing personal for those of you that have lost most of your petals. But I'm talking about, you know, when it comes to your life and your energy and your vigor. Uh, you want to give them your youth and your strength. Amen? All right. What does it say about health care workers, doctors and nurses and such who work on the Sabbath? Well, did Jesus heal on the Sabbath? And so, you know, Sabbath keepers don't walk away from sick people when the sun goes down and leave them languishing. Uh, Karen uh, was a physical therapist, and um, sometimes she was scheduled to work on the Sabbath day, and she would uh, alternate with other people that were also Sabbath-keeping friends to make sure and take care of people. Some had surgery. They needed it right away. And um, her personal decision was that work would be non-remunerative. She would then donate the proceeds from that day. But you still have to serve people. Our last question, what does the Bible say about cremation? When a person dies, they should be buried in the ground, or can they be cremated? What's God's will on that? Well, um, 
Typically, when people died in the Bible, they were buried with a couple of exceptions. Uh, King Saul and Jonathan, um, they were burned because their bodies had been mutilated. Um, now, God actually cremated quite a few people. Uh, you, you, you've got in the story of Elijah where fire came down from heaven and burned up 100 soldiers in a set of 50 and 50. You've got, uh, was it Hophni and Phinehas? The sons of Aaron, fire came down, and Sodom and Gomorrah were cremated too. But that's not what you're really asking. So typically, the human body uh, reflects the image of God, and the ancient Christians believed, that's why the catacombs were built, because the pagans used to cremate. The Christians said, we don't want to deface the, the form of God even in death, and so they would bury. I'm sure people say, well, what about Christians that were burnt for their faith? Is God going to be able to put them back together again? When all the parts are scattered, you know, don't worry about it. I think you're going to get a new body. Amen? Amen. The Lord's not coming to reassemble the old parts. He's going to give you a new body. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for answering those questions. For those of you at home or in the audience who have questions, please go to the Prophecy Encounter website where you can put your question there and give us the opportunity to try and answer it. Or you can text your questions to 760 523 And that text number again is 760 523